So Bill, I think you have to just leave your mic open. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I, love I think uh, everything's going through your speaker. That's fine. And you can see the participant list here on the side. Okay, just let me know when you want us to get started. So we'll get started as soon as the numbers kind of steady out. And I'll keep this trained on you. You look very good, Aaron. Good to go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Kiesler. I'm an MA student at uh, KCL in the Department of War Studies. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming to what's going to be an absolutely fascinating discussion. It's safe to say that much of the world was shocked by the rapid fall of Kabul and the former Afghan government, the Taliban, just a few months ago. King's College London has previously held discussions on what the future of Afghanistan may look like under the Taliban. But uh, we feel it's just as important to look back at the last 20 years of this nation building efforts and examine what decisions, actions, and events brought us to where we are today. To do this, we have brought together panelists from the US and former Afghan government who are on the forefront of these efforts to give their perspective on the challenges and shortfalls over the last two decades in Afghanistan. From the US side, we have David Young from the Office of the Special Inspector General from Afghan Afghanistan Reconstruction, uh, you may hear the term SIGAR. Uh, David Young was a supervisor research analyst in the SIGAR's Lessons Learned Program and was the lead for the agency's comprehensive reports on stabilization, elections, and its 20th anniversary report, What We Need to Learn. Uh, for those of you who haven't, I highly recommend you read this report. It is absolutely eye-opening. Uh, David served as a civilian advisor to US forces in Lagman and Nuristan provinces during the surge and as a governance advisor in Afghanistan with the World Bank, the US Institute of Peace, Adam Smith International, and Afghanistan's Independent Directorate of Local Governance. In addition to Afghanistan, he has extensive field experience in Israel-Palestine, the Balkans, the Caucasus, and Northern Ireland. Uh, from the former Afghan government, we have Mr. Abdullah Kanjani, who is the Deputy Minister of Coordination, Strategy, and Policy in Afghanistan State Ministry for Peace. In this role, he coordinated the peace process with the Taliban on behalf of the Afghan government. Just as important, Mr. Kanjani is a King's College London alum and holds an MA in Conflict, Security, and Development, and was the recipient of the Alexandros Peterson Scholarship. Finally, we have our moderator who will be taking up with me, Dr. Christine Chang, who is a senior lecturer in war studies and teaches the MA in Conflict, Security, and Development program. Working with the UK Government Stabilization Unit, she co authored Securing and sustaining elite bargains that reduce violent conflict. The final report of the influential elite bargains and political deals project. She's a co-author of Corruption and Post-Conflict Peace Building, Selling the Peace. Uh, for David and Abdullah, we are gonna give you about 15 minutes to give some opening remarks on pr your perspectives. After which point, Christine will come in to moderate the discussion before we open it to the audience for Q&A. In giving your opening remarks, I would like you to address two questions. First, after spending $145 billion over 20 years, why were the US, the Afghan government, and the international community unable to achieve lasting peace and stability in Afghanistan? And second, could the effort to build a stable democratic government and nation in Afghanistan have ended differently? Uh, David, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for that warm introduction. And thank you to Christine and King's College London for hosting this. Um, I think that the best way to answer those questions is to examine how poorly positioned the international community was to actually improve governance in Afghanistan. Speaking only about uh, US efforts, I think it's instructive to look at the contrast between what we hope to accomplish in rural communities specifically versus what was actually taking place on the ground. Our hope was that if we help the Afghan government provide better services, uh, Afghans would bestow upon it more legitimacy and the Taliban would be isolated and wither. Basically, we tried to help the Afghan government outgovern the Taliban. So we helped hire provincial and district government staff, and then we empowered them with programs that actually delivered these services. You know, everything from handing out fertilizer to training entrepreneurs to building and staffing schools and clinics. 
And the hope was that this would jumpstart a, a virtuous cycle of governance where Afghans could hold um, their officials accountable and that this in turn would make those officials motivated to, start to serve their constituency equitably. And then that this, this, this virtuous cycle would last beyond the presence of donors in the country. But that's seldom how it played out. Instead of bringing benevolent officials into people's lives, we often brought or helped bring individuals who lined their own pockets or diverted donor funds to their own ethnic and tribal and kinship groups. And other times these officials were simply incompetent, which had the same impact as if they had been corrupt. And you can imagine how disillusioning it is as a rural Afghan when you don't have much exposure to government, then your local district office gets staffed up, they're given a sizable budget, and then the money starts disappearing or you see it going towards specific groups to the exclusion of others. And the Taliban saw this as a perfect opportunity to plant roots in that community. They would approach the community and say, we will fight for you against that corrupt government. We have your backs and we will make sure your voice is heard. We just need help with food and shelter. And we need to know the names of the local officials who have betrayed you. And we need you to let us know anytime Afghan or coalition forces are passing through your village so that we can set up an ambush. And then once those lines are drawn and the community initially allies with the Taliban uh, and then government officials start getting assassinated, you can be sure that this marginalized community is now even less likely to receive services and attention. And so the cycle deepens. They become more dependent on the Taliban for support. So this chain of events all started because we sent in or helped send in officials who often exacerbated the very conflict that we were hoping they would go there to address. So you have to ask the question, why did we bring or help bring corrupt and incompetent government officials into these people's lives? It, you know, it, it certainly wasn't by design. US officials never set out to fail so spectacularly in this way. Um, so to understand why you have to go further upstream. And in fact, Upstream is where SIGAR's Lessons Learned program spends most of its time as we try to map out American systems and institutions and how they lend themselves to such counterproductive dynamics. Because the, 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 the further upstream you go, the bigger the problem gets, which is certainly frustrating, but also the clearer it becomes that nearly everything we did in Afghanistan was path dependent. That bad decisions and dynamics upstream guarantee that the people actually rebuilding Afghanistan would have few meaningful decisions to make. And from there, it, there was often no choice but the bad one. And so if you look at all the varieties of these downstream failures, and then you trace them back up, what you find is a single massive problem that caused them all. We don't prepare for these missions. When the Vietnam War ended, the American government and public were exhausted, understandably. They collectively concluded, we're never doing this again. Let's be sure to never do this again. And so why prepare for something that you have no intention of doing again? And then after an intense uh, decade or more spent training our military and civilian officials how to rebuild a war-torn country, uh, we just turned off the lights. We dismantled training houses and military units that we built up through trial by fire during the Vietnam War. And then we slashed USAID staff by 83%. But you, you really can't wave a wand and prevent another Vietnam from happening, or two of them, as it were, in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are always going to be unstable countries that demand US national security attention. So not preparing for those wars won't prevent them. It will simply mean you won't be prepared when they come all the same. And this lack of preparation came through loud and clear in Afghanistan. Across the 20 years, our latest report details how um, we ended up improvising our way through the reconstruction campaign. And you can see that improvisation all over the place, uh, specifically in our strategy. Throughout the war, there was this constant preoccupation with resources. For the first decade especially, troops and spending increased dramatically because we recognized that rebuilding Afghanistan was a monumental task, and so more resources were poured in. 
But what we often failed to notice was that our own institutions were not equipped to actually do the rebuilding. You know, for, for example, it, it doesn't do much good to significantly increase USAID's budget in Afghanistan if by doing so you have to hire inexperienced staff to oversee it. But the main variable that we thought to change was the dollars that we could point at the problem. And this of course meant corruption metastasized and conflict grew when we carelessly threw around money in communities that were not equipped to manage it um, any more than we were to disperse it. And we had trouble seeing this because we were building our own institutions from scratch. Our institutions were not ready to be on the lookout for this kind of corruption. Our institutions weren't ready to anticipate how our programs could backfire because very few people in government had studied these things in decades. Improvising also meant that our sense of time was inaccurate and highly politicized. Now, I'm sure it sounds very strange for me to say that we didn't have time to build our institutions. Even if we walked into the war completely unprepared, we had 20 years to figure things out. And that really should have been enough time to find and train talented people to do the institution building on our end. But the problem was, is that we never knew that we'd have 20 years. In fact, if you take a snapshot uh, in time uh, and interview, as we have, many people who were either on the ground or at headquarters throughout those 20 years, they all said that they always thought they were about to leave, that they were told they were always about to leave, and that they had to act accordingly. And you can imagine what this does to everyone involved from the ambassador, all the way down to the contracting officer, everyone will seek out and, and did seek out short-term solutions because the long-term just didn't exist. And for, even for the people at headquarters, why build institutions? Why um, cultivate lots of staff with anti-corruption expertise if we're about to leave? And that mentality uh, of why bother lasted for 20 years. And then compounding this was immense pressure to make fast progress in the little time that we always thought that we had left. And this pressure came from every administration and Congress. So if you wanna know why we helped hire corrupt and incompetent officials, one of the reasons is that we didn't think we had the time to do it right. And that impatience cascaded downward onto every actor involved our institutions basically became motivated to just try something, try something, try anything, because we were always about to leave. And in many cases, doing nothing would have been better, but that is certainly not an option for an army captain or a USAID program manager who is supposed to demonstrate improvement in their district in the next six months or in their area of responsibility in the next six months. So what do you do? you become an expert at creating the appearance of progress rather than actual progress. You, um, you feel thrust into a system that is rigged against you, and so you rig it right back. And that's because no one was permitted to think far enough into the future to be thoughtful. You also don't have to go very far upstream to see our own personnel constraints, which had significant downstream effects we often hired amateurs or we reassigned people whose main qualification was that they were available. And on something of this scale and complexity, the quality of our personnel has an outsized impact. They can't be recruited and trained and become skilled enough to make a difference on compressed timelines. And we saw the same problem in Afghan institutions. You can't build a capable ministry in a few years. And that's, that's really not because you can't stuff it with enough um, computers and furniture. It's because it's hard to recruit and train and retain good people. It's hard everywhere. It was especially hard at the State Department and USAID. And you can just think about it from their perspective. Let's say you run the Asia Bureau for USAID. You're already underfunded. Um, you are not permitted to have any extra staff for emergencies. Then we invade Afghanistan, and you're told this is the government's highest priority. But you're also told that we won't be there long. So you have a choice. 
do you cannibalize your own long-term programs elsewhere in Asia for a mission in Afghanistan that everyone says is just a flavor of the month? You know, that, that doesn't seem wise. So some managers split the difference by sending the staff they could afford to lose for a year, meaning, you know, not their best and brightest. And this is really emblematic of the ways in which the U.S. government was not structurally motivated to staff this mission properly. And the biggest hole in that category is the absence of any meaningful surge capacity. You know, to have good personnel for an unexpected war that may last years, you can't expect to draw good people from the existing bureaucracy. Every government agency is going to have antibodies that resist that. The ship of government, you know, just, just can't turn at that speed, especially for a temporary mission. So you've got to have a bench to draw from uh, so that a major disruption like rebuilding Afghanistan doesn't upend the entire bureaucracy. But we didn't have that bench of talent. We, so, so we hired helicopter pilots as police advisors, and we asked Navy SEALs to build relationships with rural Afghan elders. And then USAID had no choice but to hire a thousand development experts in a year. So our system completely broke down with catastrophic effects further downstream. So taken together, if the problem is upstream, the solution is upstream. We need to invest more in our own institutions so that they'll be ready to conduct these missions more effectively. And that kind of investment really can only, that kind of investment and preparation can really only take place between these large scale missions uh, and these campaigns at a time like right now. You know, we can't afford to wait until another Afghanistan or Iraq is upon us because we'll just improvise our way through it just like we did this one with the exact same results. But this, this argument that I'm making uh, for more investment is a very tough sell at this particular moment in time. Just like after Vietnam, the appetite for necessary reforms is not there because everyone wants to move on and pretend that we can just wish these missions away, but they're really not going anywhere. We've done three of these large missions to the tune of many trillions of dollars just in the last 50 years. And we conduct small scale stabilization and reconstruction missions in conflict zones all over the world on a near continuous basis. You know, we. We are strengthening the education system in Yemen right now. We are expanding access to justice in Somalia, and we're training armed forces in Niger and Mali and many other countries. So it's only a matter of time before one of these campaigns, one of these state building enterprises escalates, or we might get hit with a, another surprise mission like Afghanistan. But state and USAID in particular are not given the resources staff and, and flexibility to prepare for such escalations. Meanwhile, no one blinks an eye when the Department of Defense spends billions of dollars preparing for contingencies like air-sea battle against China, uh, you know, something that has yet to occur. Now, I'm not saying that those preparations are unwise. They seem quite prudent to me. But preparing for things that we continuously do also seems wise. Uh, rebuilding a conflict-affected country is a craft, and it really must be practiced. You know, between, between our wars, uh, our artillery brigades and our armor battalions and our fighter squadrons, they're all thinking about and practicing their craft every day. And that's exactly how it should be. You know, a, a farmer doesn't wait until he's hungry before he plants his seeds, right? So we need more people thinking about the craft of stabilizing and rebuilding conflict-affected countries. And we need them now, long before we do this again. So I'll, I'll pause there and, uh, and thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you so much, David. It was um, kind of shocking how honest you're willing to be. Um, but I think for those of you out there who have read the CR reports, it probably isn't surprising at all, but it's, it's still, I think, quite astounding to hear it from the lips of a government official. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Abdullah, who's sitting right next to me. And uh, maybe you have some reflections, too, on, on what David has said. Thank you so much, Professor and Aaron, for organizing this. It's always a pleasure to be here in a school where 
I have received so much generosity myself. Uh, I have to also acknowledge the incredible work that Dr. Young is doing, especially with his two last reports that I also benefited so much from that. Thank you, David, to you and your team. In order to understand and to respond to those two questions, Aaron, I think it's important that we need to really understand different dimensions of the historic and cultural context of Afghanistan and what we have known today, war on terror. But before that, I think it's important to uh, touch upon three uh, topics as raising them some questions for, for, the, for the audience that they may really think about it. Firstly, I think it's important for all of us to look in, back into the, the global war on terror, what has happened in Afghanistan, what has happened in Iraq, what has happened in Syria, what has happened in Yemen, what has happened, I mean, in, in many other parts of the world, I think it's important to look into that and, 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 and really deconstruct how we behave, as, especially for the American Tax, uh, taxpayers as, 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 as the superpower in the world, why we are failing almost everywhere. Why Afghanistan is not a single failure. Uh, to some extent, Iraq was the same, Syria was the same, Yemen was the same. And, and we might see, as Dr. Young was telling us, many other surprise intervention in the future too. The second uh, point that I would like to also highlight it a little bit, two things about Afghanistan mission has been super politicized, I think, in our discourses. One is about the cost and then the second one is about the duration. While all of us forget to raise two other questions connected to the cost and to the duration of the US presence in the world. I think the first one is comparing the cost of Afghanistan into the bigger, budget of the Pentagon annually, that they are still um, investing on city around the world. And secondly, Afghanistan was not only place in the world where the United States soldiers were there and stayed for 20 years. There are other countries in the world that the United States has remained post to that world, 2000 and, uh, world, uh, world War II. I think these questions are also important, and Afghanistan also need to be looked into that context in order to find a way um, how to depoliticize the cost dimensions of the war and terror in Afghanistan and also the duration of 20 years. Coming back to the questions that you have been raising, I think uh, it's important to understand the nature of the intervention in, in, in 2001 in Afghanistan. I, my reading is that the, pro, the prime objectives in Afghanistan in post-2001 was to chase the terrorists and hand them. And the state building ha, has been a secondary objective for the United States and its partners in Afghanistan. This war and terror specifically led by military, I think had a lot of primary objectives, implications, and of course, collateral damages that one of those collateral damages could be corruption. By saying this, I'm not ignoring the fact that the Afghan state remained corrupted. We as the officials, all of us to be blamed that we have exploited, we haven't shown enough patriotism in order to serve, but we have to also see it in a bigger picture, the, the corruption and the failure that we are facing today at the moment. I think I would touch upon four things which is important to understand today. First one, the political system in Afghanistan itself. A super centralized system has been developed. Of, it, it was itself a flawed design. Pouring money into that small, small, well, malfunctioning system could not produce public services. And that has happened because our or American friends were taught on that time that the super centralized dealing with two, three people would be 
one of their achievements in fighting the terrorism in Afghanistan. And most of the Afghans and most of the officials has, ha, has not, have not any agency into that conversation when the constitution of Afghanistan has been drafted and later on uh, ratified in Afghanistan. So this system is important to see. I mean, a super centralized system that a dictator could set there and his signature from the headmaster of a school to the appointment of a minister and and, and the, the, the head of the Supreme Court has created a lot of political corruption. I think we have to be very mindful that the financial corruption was a small part of the bigger political corruption in Afghanistan that most of the people are failing to recognize that political corruption internally and inter internationally. I think it's important to uh, to to look into that system, why this system could not have been able to to deliver services to the people, and in order to ignore that and reform that political system in Afghanistan, I think our partners as they started to come up with a quick fix. That quick fix was two other design in Afghanistan. One was the PRTs, provincial reconstruction teams method led by the our partners and the second one was the design of development through NGOs in Afghanistan and international which I personally believe both of them has had a lot of problem itself too. So with the PRTs I think one of the key Pro, one of the key causes that we could not develop a strong institutions, specifically at the provincial level, that was because of the PRT's lead and resources that they have been dealing with it in the past 20 years in Afghanistan, especially at the first beginning years of. So you had a even our 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 local structure and governance has become one of the one of the secondary hands for the PRTs, one of, how should I say, one of the tools for the PRT teams to react in a state of delivering themselves independently services to the people, exercising the legitimacy of the state and giving some source of support morally and financially and politically to the people. So when we are talking about failure, we have to really identify that how conflicting sometimes this two role was and how we could not identify a, a clear mandate for these two and how sometimes we replaced one by another and why we could not. And it has been almost natural that in a, in a country like in Afghanistan, if you have a commander leading a PRT team with millions of, sometimes with hundred millions of dollars, a governor with a budget of, I don't know, $2 million, they cannot compete in gaining the, the heart and minds of the people. So it's important to look at that. And I am not referring that as a corruption, but I see it as a political, as a, as a political failure for both of us. The second design that we have introduced in Afghanistan in the past 20 years has been the NGO design of development, if I may say. It. I'm sorry that because of the language barriers, I could not come up with a better wording for them, but I will try to explain them what I mean by it. So in the past 20 years, the national institutions has remained super, super weak. And in this an international community tried through the system to, to give more resources for the NGOs to replace the Afghan institutions. And David knows much better than everyone. For example, in the past one year that I worked for the Afghan government, USAID system does not recognize an Afghan entity to be the first recipient of some of its grants. It needs to be either an American company, for example, or a British company to get that grant and then they subcontract it to second one and then second one to the third one and third one to the fourth one. 
I still do see this as one of the biggest problems for Afghanistan when it comes to wasting the resources. I have seen it myself that sometimes from a hundred dollar, only ten dollars were used to come to Afghanistan, while the rest ninety dollars were used to go going through these bureaucracies of the of the NGOs, of the expert companies, firms, I don't know, these kind of stuff. And the second problem with the NGO was, um, I hate to bring this in the public uh, domain, that countries like Afghanistan easily has the potential to become a cash cow for so-called international experts, to go there and receive thousands of dollars for 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 from this for 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 being there only for 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 just sharing some of their thoughts i'll i'll give an example of myself when i joined the state ministry for peace i had few international advisors and one day i asked one of them how uh, <laughs> how much she was receiving she told me that she was receiving almost $3000 per month as a salary. And when I cost five of my advisors salary, expenses, transportation and accommodation, that was two times of my annual budget of the whole estate ministry for peace. And I start to, to, to go into like five months tough conversation at the different levels with the people there in order to cancel those contracts and told them, we need this expertise, but I don't need it at the cost of two times of my, the whole budget of the ministry. And I come up with the figures I said just with my advisors to tell them. So this angel system of development itself was a problem in Afghan society. A person who thought that he or she knows everything about Afghanistan, we used to patronize the system in Afghanistan. I'm so sorry to be using this world thing. Through a colonial system of reality towards a third world country like Afghanistan and telling very high official people what to do. And, and even some of our, our international colleagues could not understand the position of the people in the government. So even they were not respecting that the minister is there and or their advisor, not the people to do the, to do, to do, to do the exact words. This system of NGO has also reinforced the failure of the state in Afghanistan, and if I may say it. And it has been one of the key obstacles towards the development of the institutions. Because when the institutions are very weak, then the corruption is one of the byproducts of a weak institution. And the worst case scenario is if you're going to be replacing the institutions by the international entities. In order to give another example and, 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 and to pause there, I think what one of the key questions which is relevant for the future too also to look into the bureaucratic system of some of the international institutions who are dealing in the countries like Afghanistan. I'll give an example of the UN, for example. One of the, one of the key problems that I think we are repeating ourselves is that we are trying to do very inexpensive things through an expensive bureaucracy in a country like Afghanistan. I really hope that Dr. Young will, and his team would look into the expenses of the UN also in Afghanistan, how much they are spending in their security administration, administrative costs, salaries, plane charters, assets, I don't know, these kind of stuff, because Afghanistan is going into the new phase. To the, to the best of my knowledge, I'll give an example. I had a project to be, to be managed and monitored by UN agencies in Kabul. The budget was around 1.2 million, and 30% of 1.2 million, because for the sake of administration of one part of the UN agency in Kabul, they were claiming for that. 
And that budget has not been spent in the past three years because every year 3%, 30% of those budgets were going to the UN. And by, when the cobble collapsed, almost 70% of that budget has gone to the UN administrative cost, regardless of being implemented for, for the actual activities and projects in Afghanistan. And if I may go on this, it, it's not a good time to come up with different examples and facts in a public mm, domain and in public conversation, but I can go into 10 of these kind of examples to tell to the audience how this, how a poverty porn, if I may say, in a country like Afghanistan could be easily exploited by some of the inst international institutions in Afghanistan. And at the end of the day, the solo accusation and guilt and allegation go to the, to the indigenous people while they have some sort of agency, but not to be blamed for everything that has been done in Afghanistan. I'll pause here. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hear from the others. Well, as promised, very frank, very honest from both of you. Um, so much to touch upon here. And I know Abdullah told me stories as well, um, aside from the one that, that you've just shared with us. So there are lots of different ways in which we can take this conversation, but let me start. Um, let me just start by picking up on this difficulty of the fact that we tend to like to manage our money in a particular way, right? So there is a political problem here that when the money comes in as taxpayer money, we need to be accountable for it back to the taxpayers. So politicians putting all of these systems around transparency. If we don't put them in, then we get in trouble. So then David and the Seeker office is in charge of making sure that that money is spent the way it's supposed to be spent. At the same time, we have the kind of dynamic that you're talking about that every time we put in checks in the system, it ends up, you know, costing quite a lot of money as well. And frankly, to the people on the ground, to the people in Afghanistan, to Afghans themselves, that looks like corruption. And I've heard this time and again, everywhere in the world that I have gone, you ask anybody whenever they, they talk about international expats for the UN, for the World Bank, for whatever institution it is, for NGOs and so forth, they look at those institutions and say, why are the same people doing basically the same jobs getting paid three times, five times, 10 times as much money, um, even though the local people say have a lot more expertise. They look at that and call it corruption. I mean, corruption, we think about corruption in lots of different ways, but you know, the conceptualization of it is kind of lost when you're living, you know, the tragedy of it every day, right? It just doesn't look fair. And if you think about it in terms of fairness, it's absolutely not fair. But we have these systems in place. And I don't, I mean, if you two, between the two of you, manage to square that circle, David and Abdullah, you know, you'll have solved a lot of the problems, right? So at the same time, we need to manage the money in a way that satisfies our domestic audiences who are sending the money overseas and actually, you know, I pay for it as a taxpayer. Um, David pays for it as a taxpayer. Um, Abdullah, actually, now that he's here, will be paying for it as a taxpayer. But at the same time, we also know that it's insane, right? Of the maybe 10% of that money actually ends up in the hands of Afghans. And I, I think actually 10% in some cases is high. Um, and it really depends. I would love for the two of you just to, do you see some other fix way around this? How do we how do we practically deal with this problem given the concerns on, on both sides? Um, David, do you want to kick off and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Abdullah? Sure. So I think that um, it's a very difficult problem to um, to address, but I I, I, I want to add a, a little wrinkle to it. And that is that um, before we can address those larger concerns, there's also a gap in the in understanding between our uh, government oversight personnel and the people who are actually implementing, in this case, the Afghans who are implementing programs on the ground. So for instance, in uh, around uh, during President Obama's surge, there was a program called the District Delivery Program. And it was meant to, to be sort of be 
a stabilization program that was supposed to empower uh, local officials to deliver the programs that I had described earlier, right? So you, in order to deliver programs, first you have to staff up. And so this was the program meant to staff up people across the country, across key terrain districts. One of the biggest problems was that it, it was flagged by USAID for fraud alerts or misplacement of misallocation of money uh, because of a slower hand receipt process that was being put in place by the Afghans who were running the program. So it was an on budget program, meaning it was money spent through the Afghan government as opposed to going through partners. But there was still this significant gap created because our oversight personnel thought that money who had been missing when really it was simply just a matter of the receipting, the receipting process was uh, much slower to materialize. And so we shut the program down very early. We, USAID, uh, the US government shut the program down well before it had really ramped up because of these red flags that were mistaken red flags. So from my perspective, before we can address these much more seemingly intractable issues of how do you reduce the overhead of partners, there, there seems to be a, a, a bit of lower hanging fruit of trying to make sure that when we do put money on budget, when we do send money, and not just in Afghanistan, but anywhere, that there's more sensitivities to understanding what that budgeting process of the host nation country looks like so that it doesn't get shut down prematurely, so that it doesn't raise unnecessary red flags. So I think that that's certainly an easier task to address than the overhead problem uh, that Abdullah wisely raised, because a lot of that in Afghanistan in particular was due to security. And because the overhead costs completely ballooned due to security costs. Now, that doesn't mean that wasn't corruption wasn't involved. You know, there was considerable evidence that, um, that people were being paid off essentially not to attack our convoys on roads as they are driving through the country. And that plenty of that money, there's evidence that it went to insurgents. Um, and so, uh, you know that problem is uh, is is much bigger and much harder to solve in a in a place where security is rapidly deteriorating and creating that kind of overhead. So I would say that some of that overhead is absolutely due to in, inadequate and inappropriate bureaucracy doing its bureaucratic thing, and uh, some of it is due to an incompatibility and an un, un, a lack of awareness of the different ways of budgeting in different countries and and what that can mean for red flags. Uh, and then part of it is just simple security. Well, thank you. Uh, Professor, I may suggest uh, when you are intervening, when we are intervening from the West in a country like Afghanistan, I think there are three masks that we are missing when it comes to dealing in a country like Afghanistan. First of all, we have to have some sort of humility when it comes to dealing in a country like Afghanistan. We have to go with a fresh mind, with an open mind to see what's going on and to find an indigenous solution for such a problem. Most of the time, our friends at the different level from security to development to the governance, they are going with a preconceived notion that has been built based on their European system of reality, their Western system of reality. And they have become the victim of their own system of understanding rather than dealing productively with the things in Afghanistan. Aside from that, I think most of our, everyone who engage in Afghanistan, every country, they have a, convenient circle in the country. Either that's historically or that's going to be built up through the time. And sometimes most of our, most of the diplomats, most of the policy makers has become, has become the victim of that political information and advices that they are receiving through different channels. And the last thing, which is also important than most of us, we are missing by intervention in a country like Afghanistan, is that we are not listening to the masses, to the communities. We are listening to the elites. And it's very prone that a group of elites could easily manipulate us in a country like Afghanistan, especially if that country is not secure. 
it's if it's insecure you are sitting for example in your green zone in Kabul and every other night you need to write a cable back to DC or to Paris or to London you will be inviting those 10 people that you continuously know them and you think that you are happy as a human to engage with them and have a uh, aside the conversation you may be happy to have a social like a friendly dinner with 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 them too so this is one of the key problems that we have been facing in the past 20 years in Afghanistan, that an arrogance mixed with some sort of knowing everything, coming and trying to enforce your own way of solutions on the local communities, while the whole society is pushing and resisting against it. And that's the biggest lesson that we're not trying to build up on that at the moment, if I may say so. We Afghans are starving at the moment. Three to five million people will, will die if we would not reach out to them with the basics of life. But still we are reinforcing the UN system in Afghanistan, the NGO system in order to go and to invest on local social infrastructure and well-being within the society. Why we are not doing? Because it, it, it makes a lot of efforts. It, makes, it needs a lot of efforts. It needs a lot of knowledge. It needs a lot of hard work. And it needs like, you need to go and rebuild everything from the beginning. And it, we are very happy. And to be very honest, we are mostly very lazy in dealing like countries in Afghanistan. We, we, we want to just use the system, as David was pointing out, that has not been reformed in the past 20 years to be the main channel of our resources. That's why I strongly suggest that we need to really go from the beginning and see what we have learned and build new institutions, especially that the people be center and the key drivers of those institutions. Well, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to solve all of our problems in one conversation, but um, I think you guys had a good go of it. Let me invite uh, folks to put questions into the chat, please, or into the Q&A function. Um, and if you do that, I'll ask one more question, but, but please do put in questions. And what I will do is invite you to be a panelist and then I'll turn on your mic or your camera and then you can actually ask the question to whoever you want um, or, and I'll just collect a round of questions and feel free to probe as, as deeply as you want to. So please put uh, whatever your, whatever's on your mind um, about these issues into either the Q&A or the chat, okay? And um, I have another one for all of you. And I think, and this applies to both sides, right? Both to the Afghan government as well as the US government. And that is the, how do you tell an institution that doesn't want to hear the things, the nasty unpleasant things that you've had to say uh, to actually make them sit up and listen? And I say that because you know, if there was one office in the entire US government that knew what was coming, it was David's office, right? It was the cigar office. And um, and yet, right, we have so many of these reports. I've been reading these, you know, kind of glancing through the reports every so often for, I don't know, the past decade or so. It's not like the information wasn't there. It's not like the warnings weren't there, but nobody acted upon them. And then similarly, it's not like the Afghan government and people in it, there were people that knew what was coming and people did put up warning signs, right? And said, hey, look, we can't keep doing this forever. We are undermining our own legitimacy. We have problems with people believing in us. We have problems with the army feeling like they want to stay and fight. What?" can we do? And yet people would just continuously ignore all of these signs. So again, I, I know that there are no great answers to this, but if the two, I'd love to hear the two of you think about what you might see institutionally as how, how do you make, how do you, I don't know, how do you make people listen, I guess? Because I feel like the two of you probably tried in lots of different ways, right? And yet it didn't work. So 
but in some cases, you know, it, it does. And I, I do feel like after the fact, people are always happy to listen. And we look back and we see all those reports, right? Or you look back and you say, oh, so-and-so said something and so-and-so tried to say something. But at the time, it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate. And maybe this is just an impossible problem to deal with. But David, what do you think are the ways in which we could make those conditions just a little bit more welcoming, a little bit more possible um, for success, or at least for not to make the same kind of devastating failure in the future? Sure, so I think one of the critical ingredients to why um, sounding the alarm often didn't work, especially in the second decade, was because of the first decade. Once we had invested so much and spent so much time there and seen so little results and, and often things just only getting worse, it became very hard, uh, two, two things happened, one, there was just the, the sort of the fallacy of thinking uh, we've poured in so much money now, let's just give it a little bit longer and try a new strategy and, you know, or, or try a new, new component of a strategy. Um, and, the, uh, and so when that happens, you have this sense that um, it will only get worse as things get worse, that you think that um, pulling out now will only make things worse. And so you become, a, it's, it's, it's textbook quagmire. You know, you, you become a victim of, of, of you, you change the environment that you're in such that extracting yourself creates a, a far worse situation than if you just continued muddling through. And so the path of least resistance is absolutely to continue on, to try and innovate a new strategy, a new approach. It is institutionally far easier to tweak than to pull the plug because of the amount of investment that has gone in and the widespread recognition that everything, that, that a withdrawal would be catastrophic. Um, so that's, that's the reason why reforms are hard once you're in it, right? How to actually um, work around that and navigate it. We have found, I think that there's, I would say there are two ways of doing that. The first is um, it's not enough among those who study this closely to be right, right? We have to really, I think, um, and, and that, that assumes that, that those of us who do study it are right and we're often wrong. So I wanna put that out there first. But one of the things that I think is critical is that for those who study it closely and who feel like their message is not getting through to policymakers in particular, there needs to be improvements in the modes of communication. And, it, and it's not enough to, to perfect the research, but it's in the messaging. And, and how you message it and, 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 and that improving how we manage up essentially in this, among State Department, among USAID, among DOD officials and communicating that with Congress and with the American public. I think that's a, a critical um, uh, piece of it. The other piece for, for reforms, we found far greater success uh, in, in our lessons learned program uh, or we found significant success in trying to implement reforms that aren't related to Afghanistan, but are related to the institutions for future missions. This was why the Lessons Learned program was established to begin with, is to capture the lessons from Afghanistan and make sure that we learn them certainly for the next time and or for ongoing operations, even at the smaller scale, and then to the extent possible in Afghanistan, you know, a, a, as, as possible. And so those two methods, I think, are, are, are critical components of that of improving the way that we communicate our understanding. And, uh, and second, recognizing that once you're in that quagmire deep in it, the reforms really need to be framed around the institution itself rather than a hope of changing things in Afghanistan. Uh, and so, you know, that, 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 that's a, a, it's, a, it's quite a bit of humility, as, as Abdullah had mentioned, that it requires. Um, but it's, that's where we have found more success. And so, you know, we've, we've gotten our reforms into congressional legislation. Uh, the American uh, US government agencies have adopted many of our recommendations. Uh, and we found that those are, are critical victories uh, as a result of persistent um, um, co collaboration and cooperation with them. That's great. Um, and yeah, what you said actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, the political management of it, I've seen myself um, in working with the UK government, a key part of it is actually trying to be more political than I think most people who work on this stuff normally are, but an obvious key to success. Abdullah, what do you think? 
Well, quickly to the how to make people to listen to you, especially if they don't like what you want to say. It's the toughest job you may have, especially if you are a, within a rentier estate because you would face a lot of consequences of <laughs> your resistance towards some of the things that you see it's going in the wrong direction. But I think, I mean, for, for a different design of intervention in a, in a country like Afghanistan, my humble suggestion would be that there should be some sort of check and balance in a design in the whole, whole mission. And the reform shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing through the people who are implementer. Reform should be itself one of the strategic objectives, needs to be done through a third party that may have enough leverages on all parties to implement that reform. Having said that, I think one of the biggest problem in the past 20, 20 years in Afghanistan has been that the reform has become so politicized, both inside the Afghan government and among our international friends. I remember I was a journalist uh, until 2019. I was the critic of government myself for a long time. The reform agenda has become a part of the verbal abuse between President Kazai and, and some of the people sitting in DC. Regardless of looking into nitty gritty of the reform within Afghan society. So we have to make sure in the future that we depoliticize our reform agenda and we give it to the institutions, not to the implementers to bring reform. That's necessary and I pause here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to invite our wonderful guests to actually ask their questions. So um, I've got I've got a few people who I've managed to add and then I've got uh, an anonymous person. So um, I should have Anusha and then Jim and then I'll ask the anonymous attendees question. And then I've just tried to add Rachel as well. Um, so maybe Anusha, you could kick us off and if you could just tell us um, where you're from and, you know, a little bit, a few words about yourself, that'll just give some context for our panelists when you ask our question. And I think um, our panelists can also see the questions in the Q&A or in the chat, one of the two. So Anusha, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cheng. Um, so my name is Anusha and I am a, a very proud war studies uh, alumni. Um, I graduated in 2017. So, um, and I'm currently a sort of an independent sort of researcher slash journalist. Um, and I was just wondering, this is this a lot of, this has been lots of talk about how the US has failed in, in Afghanistan. And that seems to be sort of the, where the main focus is. But my question is more of, uh, and this is to both the panelists, to what degree has, um, would you say that it's corruption within Ghani and his close circle um, that led to, you know, to the failures that we see today? Okay, so I'll, Mm, I'll leave that one. Do you want to take that? No, no. Okay, okay. I'll, 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 let, I'll leave that for a moment. Um, and then I'll take the next one from Jim. Maybe, Jim, you could ask the first one, and then I'll, I'll come back to you for the second one, just to make sure that we get through everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Jim Dingman. I'm in New York City. I have been a journalist for several decades. Uh, I was down in lower Manhattan the day the World Trade Center was attacked. So that still remained in my throat for many weeks afterwards. Uh, but uh, what also remained in my throat and my brain was, and this is both to David and to Abdullah, was the inability of the United States to deal with these kind of situations to start with. Uh, because in David's comment, and I must admit I want to thank David for all the work you guys at SEGAR have done over the years. Those reports have been quite illuminating. You mentioned Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, I could go back into Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. I mean, uh, you know, the question is how institutionally is the United States prepared to deal with these kind of complicated situations in the third world, period? And do they really learn? 
And with Abdullah, uh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask you more if you could talk about, you were raising the question of the, frankly, this makes me angry to hear uh, the issue of these uh, people from the NGOs coming in and essentially sucking up resources that could be used to actually impact people at the grassroots. But the question of neocolonialism comes in, and I hate to throw that in, you know, and it's you know, sometimes not used as a term these days, but what you were describing was something quite disturbing. And I know we're going to have a huge amount of after actions about what happened, et cetera. I've been seeing it happen in the United States for the past uh, couple of months. I've actually been part of that. I've actually had Barney Rubin talk for the first time about what had happened. And uh, he did a huge like gestalt for an hour and a half nonstop about what occurred. But, um, you know, I just want to raise those things to you because, you know, I was asked to come and co uh, comment at the Council on Foreign Relations a couple of weeks after the attack. And I was pretty pissed off about what had happened. I wanted revenge. Uh, I think that some people are going to, with this whole argument they're making about the bond talks as an inflection point, they're going to forget the fact that most Americans were not interested in any kind of uh, compromise with the Taliban. They wanted to crush them. And so even though in retrospect that may be looked at as a lost opportunity, which I can see is coming up, people are going to forget that like people were blinded with their desire to crush them after what occurred. So, you know, I just want to, I just raise those points because, you know, I'm 72, I've watched and lived through Vietnam, so I sort of have that baggage in my brain. And what I've just see, seen is frankly a even worse repetition of what occurred. Uh, back in the uh, mid '70s, and I and I have to be rather blunt about that, having served there myself. So anyway, thank you so much. Very thoughtful to listen to this. I'm glad these kind of conversations are starting. Thank you, Jim. Um, that's that was very heartfelt um, and difficult to Abdullah. Do you want to take whatever you want to take out of the the answers that you might want to give from those? I questions? think Dr. Young will go first. And if you allow <laughs> me, I'll come after him. David, David, do you want to do you want to give a go of uh, whatever you'd like to take from from those questions? I, I think I, I will say that maybe not everybody wants to answer all of these questions, and that poor David there is still acting as an official government employee. So there may be things that uh, I trust that you might not want to say. No worries. I appreciate the uh, the caveat. Um, we tend to study systems over specific individuals. Um, we are look. We look more often at um, problems with specific programs. Certainly, our auditors. Uh, uh, we, we do have an investigations directorate that looks at crime, um, and they they have you know. There's been about 160 convictions uh, through that through um, through our SIGAR's investigations directorate uh, since the beginning of the of the um, since SIGAR was established. Um, but the, our, the, the role of senior level officials is uh, an open question um, and one that we don't typically look at. I will say that Congress has asked us to look at the allegations in the news lately um, and significantly on social media that senior Afghan officials absconded when they fled the country, took uh, large amounts of cash uh, with them. And this is something that we are looking at and that, uh, that research is underway right now. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But to the, we cert, we do not uh, make a habit of looking at specific individuals from a research perspective, only from an investigation, a criminal investigations perspective. And that's not something that I could really speak to, uh, as I am not a, a criminal investigator for Cigar. Um, as for the uh, Jim's question, I think it's uh, you won't be you won't be satisfied with the answer. But the answer is typically that we don't learn. Uh, from these mistakes. Um, and just as two um, sort of salient examples in my mind is that SIGAR has encountered multiple lessons learned reports from that were post-Vietnam. One, um, or actually one was post-Vietnam on security sector reform that closely mirrors this the analysis, lessons, and recommendations of our own security sector analysis for Afghanistan. So these were recommendations and lessons and analysis that essentially was put into a drawer and, uh, and, and never used um, in the wake of Vietnam. There are also on the civilian side, USAID has done lessons learned reports. Uh, if, as you may remember, there was a, a great deal of USAID support to Southern Afghanistan 
uh, before, well before Vietnam, during sort of in the in the um, uh, cold during the Cold War, and there were lessons learned on that on that assistance as well in southern in southern Afghanistan that were likewise mostly ignored for the next time we went in. And so part of this is a, you know, you could look at it from a technical perspective is that it is a knowledge management issue. Where did these reports go? You know, it was just, it was by luck that we encountered them. Um, they were not at the top of everyone's agenda during the invasion and during the 20 years. And so that's the technical perspective. And then there's the political perspective is that these, the reforms are so difficult and the, there's so much resistance in our own agencies to actually commit to these reforms, that it's not a matter of these um, um, the the ideas being um, or, or the reports being discarded or ignored. It's that even good people with good intentions, who are smart, trying to do the best they can, were unable to achieve these reforms. Which begs a much larger question: Instead of asking, "What do we need to do to do this right?" We ha as, as as professionals in this field, we have to ask the question. Are we capable of this? You know, and it is an it is absolutely an open question, um, and it is certainly a a credible argument to be made either way. Um, but at this stage, that we're that we're committing so much, so many resources and time and effort to rebuilding countries at this scale, and we don't really have a model for it working, begs the question: Is this something that needs to be tweaked? Or is this is the theory of the case completely flawed? And again, it's an open question. But I certainly share your frustration, uh, Jim, that it's um, that we it does not appear that we are learning these lessons. And I will say, um, just like at the end of Vietnam, there was there were some reforms and and um, uh, sort of clear-eyed thinking, sober assessments as to what was what had had gone wrong in Vietnam, and we're seeing some of that today. While the, the, the sort of the, the institutional resistance to these larger reforms are, is there, I definitely want to give credit to Congress and U.S. agencies for committing to certain reforms for small scale reconstruction and stabilization. You may be familiar with the Stabilization Assistance Review and the Global Fragility Act and the Global Fragility Strategy. These are all really difficult undertakings that, in particular, DOD, state, and aid have undertaken to try and come to the necessary consensus for how these three agencies in particular can work together in the future, uh, whether it's small or big, but they, they certainly have small scale stabilization in mind um, to do this more effectively. And they are, you know, the, the, the reforms are important, they're moving in the right direction, but they're, they need considerably more, um, more of this. But I, I definitely wanna give them credit for, um, for, for significant, um, uh, movement away from the inertia that we saw, you know, for basically the first 15 years of this war. Thanks, David. Abdullah. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, to the first question, I have two disclaimers, to be very honest and sure. Firstly, I'm ashamed of myself most of the time to be part of a government that collapsed and to be alleged to be super corrupted to be very honest. So I have no moral authority to come up and criticize others. I, 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 I feel it every minute, to be very honest. Despite I had a very unique position and job, which was policy, political coordination of the peace process. I was nothing to do with money at all in my, in my section. The second disclaimer is since I'm coming from a different political constituency, if I may say, so I've been critic of the president himself as inner circle. I, I, I do not see any position for myself to come up and comment on that. But generally, I may say two things, which might be um, something to be considered by Dr. Young too. Firstly, I think we all need to be, all of the government, ex-government officials need to be held accountable. And even we are now in a better position hundreds of our high officials, now they are living in the United States and there should be an investigation on their wealth. There should be an investigation on their bank account. And that should be started from myself in UK. 
I'm not saying that I have been super clean and go after the others. And I think American ta taxpayers has the best opportunity could ever present themselves to come after those who have failed the people of Afghanistan, their money, and the image of everyone. The second uh, point that I would like to make that we need to also make sure that when it comes to dealing with investigation on the corruption, that we take it out of the political discourse that we have towards Afghanistan. Politicization of conversation over reforms, over, I don't know, corruption, over making people accountable, that creates more complication from, for all of us. And I think it's important that we shouldn't be looking only about taking few millions of dollars out the day that we have been escaping Afghanistan, but also look into 20 years, how much everyone has made it in the past. And to be very honest, they're very well-known people for the US establishment. They know who has been our finance minister. And they know their, their, their villas in, in, in Miami, I don't know, in, 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 in DC. So you don't need to go on into a very super complicated um, international system in order to find out these things. If you're gonna ask Emeritus, they will give you a, a details of how much an Afghan who has an Emirates. I really hope that this conversation go there. To the point of Jim, Jim, I think I fully understand your frustration, anger, and I share with you. We are here today to discuss because we don't want me and you and your grandson in the future to be again angry and frustrated with what has happened. I have lost my country. It, it is not easy. I've never been out of my country in my life. I spent it five regimes there, five regime changes there. And now I, I fully understand what it means to not have a country. It's nothing to do that I could not live in the West. It's something different that nobody can really understand, that nobody understand you if you would not be in such a position yourself. Thank you, Professor. <sighs> Yeah, this is kind of, I have to say, this is kind of heartbreaking. Um, I gave Abdul a big hug when he uh, arrived in London shortly after we arrived. And Thank you so much for that, Professor. It's pretty, you know, and, and Abdul isn't the only student that, that I've had also to, to be going through this. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, very hard. Um, I have a couple, I have more people with more questions, but I'll read the one from our anonymous attendee first. So uh, one of the main examples of corruption is nepotism. Um, again, this is another President Ghani question. Appointed all the key positions of government, specifically the key positions of security institutions based on nepotism and ethnicity, not merit. I'd like to know the insight of panelists on the role of nepotistic recruitment on the collapse of government to the Taliban. And I feel to some extent that's kind of being addressed by David in his comments. Um, and I think Abdullah can, can answer that if he if he wants to. Um, but let me let me move on to uh, Rachel has a question, and then we have a couple more anonymous questions, which I'll read out in just a moment. So Rachel, why don't you introduce yourself too? Absolutely. Are you able to hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm Rachel and I'm just pursuing an MA in um, actually under also under Christine's guidance here at King's and am particularly interested in kind of the um, operational level of uh, actually getting um, I guess more more localized and in in touch aid uh, via these international programs uh, through of course you know just going to your point that 30 percent of, uh, of it can go to overhead, and, but at the same time, the necessity of security and, and sometimes those administrative processes being run anyway. How to ameliorate that? You guys both spoke more on communications and modes of communication in ameliorating some of those costs that can then 
not only more um, be more situationally engaged and actually bring about some of these these uh, uh, projects in a more cohesive manner, but what is is some of the I suppose my question relates to if you are trying to fix those modes of communication, what are some ways you can actually operationalize that? Um, is, this, is this training programs between the NGO staff and the local community? How do you merge the gap between the people and the NGOs that are working with them? If you must funnel the funds and equipment and staff through the NGOs and through the what has been termed multiple times the bureaucracy of it. How can you how can you do so in a more meaningful manner? All right, I think that one seems aimed at David, so uh, you can like that. I think there's a version of it in the chat as well. So um, I'll read out two more questions for you. So also, there's one um, from an anonymous attendee, and this one's for David as well. What is now the outlook for America's position on counterterrorism when it comes to its 20 year involvement in Afghanistan? War on terror was the initial goal for US intervention and the mission creep into institutional building came afterwards. So what does the withdrawal mean for the US's fight against domestic terrorism? Um, and then this one is for the panel and I, I think Abdul is well positioned to answer it. So what does the current outlook mean for China as it shares the border with Afghanistan? How has China been involved with the US and Afghan actors in Afghan state building prior to, to the withdrawal this year? And what can this mean in the context of US-China relations post withdrawal? So there's a lot of talk around China <laughs> everywhere. Um, and we'll see what, uh, what you all think of this. So David, do you wanna try and and take a, have a go at some of the, the ones that were directed at you. Sure. So uh, CIGAR is basically in the business of illuminating risks for the US government and then trying to help the US government understand whether those risks can be, can be mitigated and if so, how they can be mitigated. Um, Counterterrorism, however, is uh, not one of the risks that falls under our purview that is in our that is in our job scope or mandate to highlight. Right. So, for instance, you know, the oversight that we provide to the U.S. government isn't about, you know, isn't about drones. It's not about U.S. forces, um, you know, uh, own sustainment or weapons. And, you know, it's, it's about reconstruction. Right. And so the risks that we highlight are, rather than about counterterrorism are much more risks to civilians, uh, risks to uh, funds that we have provided already being lost or seized by the Taliban or equipment seized by the Taliban that was originally provided through that reconstruction mandate. Uh, so I couldn't speak to the risks of counterterrorism and what that means for the withdrawal, but I'm sure my colleagues uh, have interesting things to say about it. Regarding the, uh, the NGO question uh, uh, from Rachel, I think that the, the Building up support for NGOs and empowering them really um, draw it, 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 the the dilemma um, brings into focus a a critical choice and that is and that comes down to what can we do that is sustainable. For instance, you, there's basically two paths. Let's say you wanted to run a program in Afghanistan, USAID or DFID or now FCDO, you know, um, wanted to run a program uh, in Afghanistan. You can either go through the government, which then pays its own, you know, its own ministry staff, and then it feeds out through the government into an implementing partner, uh, which is would inevitably be uh, Afghan, or you can bypass the government, go straight to an implementing partner, like, you know, what you might normally call like a, a development contractor, like Comonix or Creative or AECOM, that then outsources it further, you, almost always, one step further to an implementing partner sometimes Afghan, sometimes international again. And then eventually, like we discussed, it, it in theory should make its way to an Afghan partner that is subcontracted. And we talked about how the, that process of subcontracting creates many overhead cutouts so that a very small portion of it actually makes it to the ground, right? For me, the, there is, it is in, in a country that suffers from major human capital constraints like Afghanistan in terms of literacy, and human development, you're going to have that problem if you want to have that, that happy middle ground of 
um, where the costs are, the, the transactions are transparent, they match with and are aligned with oversight requirements and standards, but still empower uh, local, local officials and local partners, right? There's going to be that tension and a, a significant loss of, uh, of the actual uh, money going to beneficiaries. So mitigate that, absolutely. To me, the bigger question, though, is on sustainability. Bypassing the government as a whole created no enormous problems for basically meaning that the government couldn't practice financial management of those funds so that when we took our hands off the clock, the gears would keep grinding, right? And so that is one of the reasons why so much of what we did was unsustainable was because we bypassed the government. And, you know, in fairness, we had some good reasons for doing that because the, their capacity and ability to manage those funds was extremely limited. Uh, and, every, and most of the time that we did, we thought we encountered major obstructions, potential fraud, corruption, et cetera. So you can't really have it both ways where we say there's so much corruption in the Afghan government on the one hand, and on the other, you should go through the Afghan government for everything for sustainability purposes. There's tension there, and we got to deal with that. Um, but I think that the real question for how do you empower an NGO to, to, do the, uh, to build and implement programs in a, in a way that is sensitive to the community's needs and takes them into account, the first path through is to make sure that it's sustainable. Um, and simply uh, having us directly empower these NGOs does not create a sustainable model if those NGOs, as soon as we leave, don't have a reliable partner in the Afghan government to feed it to them. So to me, that's sort of an upstream problem that has to be addressed before we can really talk about how do we shave off a little more for beneficiaries in the subcontracting process. Okay, I'm gonna hand over now, and there's a final question here. And I think it's actually an important question. Um, it's very much a moral question. And it's directed at Abdullah, but David, you're, you're welcome to comment back after Abdullah speaks as well. Um, it's about the issue of humanitarian intervention and the, the famine that's basically taking place right now. Um, I think I actually know your thoughts on this, but what does he think about the present policy of withholding billions of dollars from the Taliban government to deal with the present situation inside Afghanistan and recognizing that it's domestically very difficult in order to um, have this money be sent to the Taliban government? So I'll let you comment on that question and the China question and anything else you want to touch upon. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, firstly, with the nepotism, uh, I think one of the key factor that most of our European allies has been have been missing in the past 20 years has been the role of nepotism and identity politics and, it, and the role of ethnicity within the politics of Afghanistan. And I don't blame them because in the West, you don't have such a thing. You only would like to deal with those phenomena naturally that is very familiar to you. If you are not familiar with those phenomena, you, you could not easily understand that issue. In my own, I mean, my reading is one of the foundation for the corruption, one of the key causes for the failure, one of the key obstacles towards an institution building in Afghanistan has been the nepotism and identity politics, sadly in, in the past 20 years. And instead of promoting an institutions, the leadership tr always try to rely on a strong people who are loyal to them and ended up ruling of two, three people over 35 millions, or ruling of 300 elites overall in the country over 35 million people. And that's where I think we need a lot of more attention and research how this patrimonialism within the system of governance in the past 20 years in Afghanistan has led to current failure and how big driven factor it has been. So I let you to decide how it, it really uh, caused failure in Afghanistan. With the, if you allow me, I 
remembered uh, a story that I would like to share with Rachel, regardless of uh, judging it, I'll, I'll put a moral lessons for all of us. So Rachel, I was in the State Ministry for Peace. One day, uh, a friend of mine, a journalist, a Westerner journalist, showed up in my office. And she told me that she's very proud to receive the good project from USAID for communication uh, and the peace process. She was a long, long time friend to me. And then she explained her program to me. And then I told him, that's wonderful. That was about peace education. And then I told him, that's a very good idea. After, don't, you, don't you think after 20 years in the state of you coming from West, to do two hours of seminar on peace education. I can hire someone with PhD from Stanford, for example, who is an Afghan now in Kabul, that he could do this job. She told me, well, I will go back to the people and get back to you. This conversation continued between me, the consultancy and some of the people in UECID for three months. After three months, they come up with an idea. They told me, well, we'll not bring for one day seminar anymore, someone from the West, but we would like to pay only $200 if you wanna hire that guy from a Stanford graduated Afghan guy to do this job. And I told them, why is this? By bringing a journalist from the West, you are paying at least for the round trip ticket, you are paying for accommodation of a week, for an armored car, for the security, for, I don't know, salary. And at least it may cost something between 20 to $30,000. I mean, I'm talking about an estimation. I could never have answer of that question. And that was disturbing for me. And I stopped it at the cost of my friendship with that journalist. I told them, no, under my leadership, it would not happen because I don't, we are, we are violating the common principles of morality when it comes to dealing. While this 30 or 20 or $10,000 could be enough, could, could have more beneficiaries in our funds. And, and I think that's where we ended up what Dr. Young was saying, that I fully understand that there has been a generalization when it comes to corruption within the Afghan society and the, and, the, and, and, and the Afghan institutions. I called 10 times my partners to come over and do an investigation to give me some sort of credential that at least I am not corrupted. Nobody come up, but in every conversation, almost with every diplomat and every ambassador, there was one thing which I can consistently hearing from them that there is Afghan government is corrupt. So we would like to find an alternative way to, to help you. With the China uh, professor, we really do not understand yet how the China will reposition itself post 2000. And we know that the Chinese are very cautious about it. One thing that they are doing at the moment, of course, they are exploiting maximum PR out of the failure of the United States by tweeting. But we haven't seen yet the China to become an important development partner for the Taliban yet. And we haven't seen also the China to have an independent from Pakistan uh, a policy towards the Taliban because it would be it has a lot of other causes that I think time does not allow us to to elaborate into that about the moral question the anger in Afghanistan humanitarian crisis professor you remember we have every right to oppose the Taliban but not at the cost of the life of the people but I would like to also take this opportunity and alert the people in DC and here, everyone, on two very problematic policy that I do see most of our Westerner, Euro, Westerner partners might be following in coming months. Firstly, there is a premise that the Taliban is 
reformable, if I may say it. I don't know if it's English reformable or yeah. not. So reformable. And that's why most of the country, most of the Westerners think that they could leverage through, uh, through financial means to change the behavior of the Taliban. And this has been exactly the premise that we have built our peace process upon that. While it didn't, it didn't produce enough result. I really, really hope that we would not put again billions of dollars on such a mate of Taliban being a reformable group ideologically and, and changing their behaviors in the coming years. So that's why I think it's important to come back to the questions that who we are partnering again in Afghanistan. Because as David has been pointing out at the beginning, one of the key reasons for the uh, and cause for the failure in past 20 years has been that the United States has partnered up with the wrong people in Afghanistan. The biggest example was President Karzai, who turned out to become totally different. And Ghani was the second example. And the second warning is, I'm not ignoring and denying the importance of NGOs and UN in Afghanistan, but there is a, there is a need for reform in their expenses. I was listening the other day, a friend of mine told me that, for example, when it comes to climate change, from every dollar, UN only has spent 15 cent of it. 85 cent is going into the, into the talks. And if I may, I mean, Afghanistan, the security situation, lack of a good partner, lack of an strong institutions, the collapse of the NGO system in Afghanistan really, really increased the risk that most of this money instead of going to the people, it would go to the salaries, to the armored car, to the security companies to, to provide securities. While I was thinking recently that there is a lot of indigenous kind of social welfare system historically in Afghanistan that we could go and reach out to the people and give them the money. And thank you so much, Professor. And I really hope that I, could, I was able to, to respond to these questions. That was brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you from both of you. I think you made it through some pretty tough material and I think you are both very honest and reflective of so many of the mistakes that we've seen over the past 20 years. And I think everybody in the audience really appreciates that. So. Thank you so much to the two of you for engaging like this. Thank you to Aaron for helping us organize. Thank you to Danny who's behind the scenes here. Um, and this will all be recorded or has been recorded and will be posted. Um, there might be things that you want to share with people in DC, friends, journalists, feel free to tweet it out. And hopefully the situation, well, we know the situation is going to get worse. The only question is how much worse and how long will it last? And yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is not going to be our last Afghanistan discussion. So um, thank you so much to everybody. Have a have a great day. I have to run off and teach now. So um, David, we'll catch up. Oh, Dave, when you stay online, we can chat a bit. Um, and to everybody else, thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. <laughs>